Please welcome Murray Clay of Ulupono Initiative. Aloha. There are a number of proposals circulating through the legislature right now and also one as a study with the Department of Transportation. Oh, sorry, we need to back up that are looking at uh, various proposals that will either decrease incentives or increase tax rates on electric vehicles. And as electric vehicles are a very big part of our renewable energy goals, this causes some concerns. We decided to dig deeper into one of those, namely the Department of Transportation study to look at possibly replacing the gas tax with a vehicle miles traveled tax. So first off, what's wrong with a gas tax the way it, it stands today? It is the single largest source of funding for the state highways from state sources. And as electric vehicles clearly don't use gasoline, they don't pay any gas tax. And as EVs, but also other fuel efficient vehicles like hybrids increase, logically the gas tax will decline. So we do have a problem here or a potential problem in the future. But is it really a problem now? So if you look at this green line, that's gas tax revenue from 1997 to 2016. And you can see it's pretty much up and to the right, maybe a little bit flat in recent years, but don't really see a big problem here. Now I added to the bottom of that slide 100 cars in red, and you can see hopefully the little green car in the, in the center. That represents the 0.63% of vehicles on Hawaii's roads that are electric vehicles. So whether you look at the actual dollars that are coming in, or just logically think about 0.63% of the cars, it just can't be causing a material problem in gas tax revenues. It's just not possible. Let's take a step back, though, and look at how the highways are funded in, in total, not just the gas tax. The gas tax, though, is that 31% share of the pie. You've got weight taxes at 29%, registration fees at 16%, and other surcharges at 20%. So that's the total pie for the state side, excluding federal, of highway funds from uh, highway funding. So this is the same information I showed you a minute ago, same green line. It looks different because I had to increase the y-axis quite a bit to allow for that. So the blue line is total highway funding revenues, which includes the registration fees, the weight tax, the gas tax, everything that you saw in that previous pie chart. So we can see that that increased from 133 million in 1997 to 271 million in 2016. That's an increase of 104% over that time period. And even if you break that down to an annual rate, that's still 4% a year, which is higher than annual inflation over that time period. So in terms of total funding, the state highway fund has never been better. So what is a VMT and why are, is DOT studying a tax to replace the gas tax? So as I said, VMT is vehicle miles traveled. It's also known as a road user fee or a road tax. It charges per mile driven and there's no direct linkage to gas consumption, but it's a simple pay as you go system where you pay for how much road you use rather than how much fuel you burn. Now to be fair, the Department of Transportation actually does deserve some credit for looking ahead at problems that don't exist yet but will be coming in the future. So often in the state it seems like we're playing catch up with, with uh, problems that come up. So they are planning ahead and they deserve to be commended for that. It's also fair to point out that most transportation planning experts and most of the academic literature on the subject do have the gas tax as either the complete or part of the right answer for a situation with declining gas tax revenues. So that's what's right with a VMT tax. What's wrong with a VMT tax? So the way the Department of Transportation is studying it presently, they're looking at the same flat VMT tax per mile for all roads and all vehicle types. Now that can definitely work for funding transportation. That can absolutely replace the gas tax, no problem. But it does not help us with our energy goals nor our environmental goals as it doesn't incentivize energy use reduction and a certainly lower emissions. So those two are kind of fails on that point. Now this may seem totally irrelevant, but I got to ask, uh, how many of you are willing to admit you watched Sesame Street growing up? It will become relevant in a moment. Good. Okay, very good. So you like Big Bird too. All right. So on almost every episode of Sesame Street, they play this game called which one of these things is not like the other? And I can hear the jingle going through my head that went along with that. My staff begged me not to sing it, uh, so I'll spare you that today. But we are going to play the game, so which one of these things is not like the other? 
So hopefully you can pass the Sesame Street challenge and realize that although they're all different in some ways, the electric vehicle in the lower left-hand corner is the most different vehicle up there. But again, under the presently studied VMT tax, all of these vehicles from the Hummer to the EV would be charged exactly the same rate per mile. And it's not just Sesame Street. EVs are very different. They are three times more efficient in energy usage compared to internal combustion engines. They're more easily powered by renewable energy. So electricity in Hawaii is roughly 25% renewable. Transportation fuels are less than 1% renewable. So it just turns out the easiest way to make transportation renewable is to electrify it. And then added to that, through smart uh, discharge and charging program or technologies that are starting to come out, as well as uh, time of use and EV-friendly rate structures that the utility is starting to come out with, EVs can actually increase the amount of renewables that we can take onto our grid if they're used properly. And then added to that, electric vehicles, as I think we all know, are zero emission vehicles at the tailpipe. You say at the tailpipe, and of course people, especially uh, detractors, will say, well, yeah, but what about total life cycle emissions? And the detractors will point out that it does truthfully take more emissions to create an EV than it does an internal combustion car. But what about total life cycle? So luckily we have this really great study from MIT, very robust, very technical, where they go through 125 of the most popular vehicles that were sold in 2014, so a couple years old, but took a few years to put this together. It's the 125 most popular vehicles, and the, let's see if I can make this laser work. The emissions are on the y-axis, and uh, they broke it up into, well, for, first of all, I should point out that total life cycle emissions literally includes everything. So before I go farther, I should point out it does include the fuel combustion, the production, distribution, and storage of fuel, the production, shipping, and disposal of the vehicle. So everything from the time you build the vehicle to the time you dispose of it, and everything in between is included in this emissions analysis. Nothing kind of got a pass. The black dots are internal combustion engines, the pink are hybrids, and the yellow are EVs. So even when you look at total life cycle emissions, everything from creation to destruction of that vehicle, EVs use far less or create far less greenhouse gas emissions. Case in point, the Nissan LEAF has half the greenhouse gas emissions of the average internal combustion car by sales. And even if you compare it to a compact, really small internal combustion engine, it's still 38% less. So there's just no argument that uh, they don't save emissions. Okay, the reason we have this, this uh, problem that I'm trying to paint a picture for you on the, this replacement of the gas tax with the vehicle miles travel tax, we have a fundamental disconnect within government. The Department of Transportation logically is in charge of transportation. Energy is sort of watched over by the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, especially the State Energy Office. And I think many of you folks are here from the Energy Office. And the environment is sort of a combination of the Department of Land and Natural Resources, the State Office of Planning, and the Department of Health. So kind of a, a combo deal there. But each one of these separate functions, to some extent, acts in a silo. Maybe not entirely, but to some extent, they operate independently. So the Department of Transportation is doing its assigned job, but it's ignoring some of the energy and environmental issues that do come up and are very closely linked to transportation. Okay, so I had to throw this picture up there. Hopefully you can make that out. This is the winner of the Not My Job Award. And if you can't make that out, it's a little fuzzy. That's roadkill, and uh, they just painted the yellow lines right over the top of the roadkill. Now, to be fair, it, it probably was literally not in the guy's job description to remove roadkill before painting lines. It probably wasn't in his job description. But, you know, we can really do better than that if we will work across functions and across departments within the state to think about the impacts that our policies have on other sections of the government and our lives. So VMT taxes could be part of the right answer. But with EVs being such a small share of passenger vehicles, again, 0.63%, it's pretty small. Uh, there's really no need to switch over completely nor immediately. We shouldn't be discouraging energy efficiency and lower emissions so early in the EV adoption curve. The simple fix of swapping out the gas tax just wholesale for a VMT tax, especially a flat across the board VMT tax, is simply bad policy. So here's one potential solution. There's several, but here's just one potential solution we thought we'd throw out there. So this is uh, done in real dollars. There's no inflation here, just so we can show constant dollars as constant dollars. The yellow line is keeping those gas tax revenues exactly the same over time. So that's the requirement, is to keep funding for the highways exactly the same, not dropping it. 
The green line is the gas tax revenue line. And as EVs increase, and EVs are here on the x-axis, there's 0%, 25, 50, 75, 100% EVs. So as EVs increase, gas tax revenues will fall. And what we're proposing is that the VMT tax started essentially zero and increase over time until when it's 100% EVs, you end up with a VMT tax about eight tenths of a penny per mile. Now, if you do that, you can keep funding exactly the same, have the gas tax slowly decline as it naturally will as EVs increase, and slowly implement the VMT with a very low rate that slowly increases over time as EVs increase. By doing so, that slowly increase in VMT exactly offsets the shortfall from the gas tax, transportation is funded, and yet you're still incentivizing energy efficiency and lower emissions. Okay, so here's a policy comparison by vehicle type, and to keep it from being a, a really noisy bar graph, I just picked three vehicles. We picked the Leaf, Camry, and Hummer as kind of uh, types of, of very efficient, medium efficient, and very inefficient vehicles. The one on the left is the current gas tax. The one in the middle is the VMT tax where everyone pays exactly the same rate per mile, and the one on the right is the proposal that I just showed where the VMT slowly increases as gas tax declines. Now, I had to pick a number to show the bar chart, so that one on the right is at 50% elect, uh, electric vehicles. And that's about 79 times where we are right now, so we're still a long ways away from that point uh, to getting to that point. But you can see in this way, it is possible to have everyone pay something for using the roads. No one gets it for free. But at the same time, you're still providing an incentive for energy efficiency and reduced emissions while still funding transportation. There are other options out there. That one chart I threw up was just one potential example. Some of the more aggressive options include no VMT at all, keep the gas tax in place, and as gas sales decline, you increase the gas tax rate to keep the revenues the same. Now, if you think about that, as EVs become a large percentage of the cars out there, that will become very, a very strong incentive for EVs to be adopted. It will become pretty darn punitive to those driving internal combustion cars, and that level of uh, uh, penalty, I guess you could call it, against uh, internal combustion drivers would probably be considered too aggressive and probably not politically feasible. Another one is the idea of fee baits, where you charge a fee to what you don't want, highly inefficient polluting vehicles, and use those fees to finance, without affecting the you know, state budget, either rebates or incentives for what you do want, zero emission vehicles. Norway does a lot of this, they do a whole bunch of other incentives for electric vehicles, and they've been so successful, they are the number one nation in the world for EVs per capita. So last year, if you include not only electric vehicles, but also plug-in hybrids, that was 40, nearly 40% 40 of new vehicles sold in 2017 were either plug-in hybrids or electrics. Even just the, the pure electrics was 20%, and with all the vehicles on the road at, right now, their EVs are about 5%. And you might say 5% is not a lot, that's still eight times where we are. So they've been extremely successful with that fairly aggressive in terms of the incentives. And they are a country, we're a state, but you know they're not a huge country, they're 5.2 million people, we're 1.4 million people, so if they can do eight times what we're doing, you know, my thought is maybe we can do better with some of, uh, of their ideas, potentially. That's another option. Some potentially a little bit less aggressive solutions include a carbon tax. There are a few states on the mainland that are considering a carbon tax, not just for climate change purposes, but directly earmarking that carbon tax for highway funding. So carbon tax goes directly to the highway fund. And instead of paying per mile driven as you would with a VMT, you're just paying per unit of emissions. Another one is to have congestion pricing. So it's time varying VMT taxes, which would incentivize off-peak driving, carpooling, shared trips, and it just follows the logic of higher demand in everything else in life generally equals higher prices. And so it probably should be the same way with the roads as well to incentivize the types of things we want to see. We would need, though, some technology changes to, ad to be able to adopt time-varying taxes like that. And uh, both policy and technology would have to be uh, changed a little bit. The technology is available, though. The other idea is to not have time varying VMT rates, but have the VMT rates vary by vehicle class. So you could have a higher VMT tax rate for a very inefficient polluting vehicle and a lower VMT tax rate, say, for electric vehicles. And that could work as well, although we should certainly expect a very vigorous debate over what a fair price is. So we understand that highway funding needs to be maintained. We've got to pay for the roads, got to fill those potholes, and that's not going to go away. Fairness does indicate that some share of that has to be based on usage. You use more, you should pay more. 
But energy and the environment are absolutely no less important than transportation. They have to be considered. We need a balance between funding our roads and rewarding more efficient, less polluting, less emission vehicles. Starting with the status quo, our current gas tax, and moving towards a VMT tax slowly over time as we need to fill that shortfall in the gas tax can really almost perfectly balance transportation, energy, and the environment. You absolutely can fund transportation without forgetting about energy and environment. So my team and I will be available during breaks if there's any questions, or you can email Greg Gogg or me at the email addresses listed below. Thank you. <laughs>